Hi, this is Jeff Buchanan. I'm a retired Lieutenant General from the United States Army. Spent 37 years in the Army, and now I spend time with organizations and helping them with leadership, leadership development, and decision-making. Today on the show, we're gonna talk about a number of things, but I'll give you three quick highlights. The first is decisions. We, you know, leaders need to have the courage to make tough decisions, but also the wisdom to know when to make those decisions. And sometimes in a crisis, the best timing is actually to not make a decision that you would regret later on. The second is I'm gonna talk a little bit about performing as if in the eye of a storm. How does a leader stay calm and make tough decisions when everything around you is turning into chaos? And I'll give examples from my experience in Iraq, Afghanistan, and in supporting FEMA through five major hurricanes. And the last topic is really about shared understanding. I believe that shared understanding is critical for leaders to have when it comes to execution. But frequently when we think about it, we think about the importance of top-down shared understanding of how things that come from the leader are supposed to get all the way down to the lowest level. And I'll make an argument and tell some stories about how important it is for the leader to get out away from that headquarters and down to the lowest levels where you can really understand the challenges that are happening where the rubber meets the road. I look forward to it, and I hope you'll join us today. Welcome back to part two of our delicious conversation with Lieutenant General Jeffrey Buchanan, retired after 37 years in the Army, and he has commanded U.S. and foreign troops through five years tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's led military forces in support of FEMA, um, he was in five major hurricanes, including Hurricane Maria. And we've been talking about making decisions in crisis. I mean, when you really think about it, you know, I don't know that we learn very much when we're not in crisis. Uh, I think we don't learn, we're very poor at learning during success. We just fall back on our laurels and we go, oh, you know, obviously I did it right. But it's when we're in a crisis that we reveal ourselves to ourselves and to others. And we spoke a lot about that uh, in part one of the show. We really dived into some of the humanity that we really need to look at. And we looked at this idea of the military command and control versus command and feedback and keeping those lines of communication open. And one of the things that Jeff was talking about was the, the need to... Uh, pay attention to the orders, but also pay attention to the context and that it's important to have a vision, but what's more important is the people who are involved in that vision. It's a fascinating first half. If you just happen to have clicked in on the second part, go back, listen to part one, I promise you, you'll find it deliciously interesting. Some really finer points that you probably would not expect um, I, I honestly really enjoyed the conversation in part one, and I know we're going to get into part two now. So let's dive into this. Um, and this is going to seem maybe a little obscure to some of our listeners, but we're in this, quote, AI age. AI has exploded in 2023. It's come out everywhere. We think of chat GPT, but it's much bigger than that. And in fairness, AI has been around for a lot, lot longer than that. And it's been around in many different ways and forms. It's just more ubiquitous in the context of people having accessibility to it. But one of the things that people don't know, Boston Dynamics have been developing robots for a very long time. And now there's a real talk of this futuristic idea that's not being so futuristic anymore, which is robot sh soldiers. And you spoke a lot about leading your men and having these conversations, getting to know them. But a robot soldier follows orders outside of context. And what's more, if you look up heroism, it requires a level of emotional intelligence. And AI doesn't have emotional intelligence. So can a robot soldier have emotionally, or can it be heroic if it has no emotional intelligence? Or is it just a robot doing its job? I want to ask a general with 37 years experience dealing with, quote, grunts, soldiers, people, real people who are just doing what they're supposed to do. What's your thoughts on it? 
I, you know, I think, for, first of all, let me just say about AI, I, uh, the, I think there's some real potential mm-hmm. to help us with uh, making better decisions uh, in a, uh, you know, collecting a lot of input, making decisions that are better informed in a hurry. But I think that there's potentially a real problem, especially when it comes to warfare, if you take the person out of the loop of that decision. Mm -hmm. If the decisions are completely executed by Mm -hmm. non-people, you've got, and you talked about emotional intelligence. I think that's certainly part of it. Uh, I, I think there's issues with morality. You know, you can go right. back and look at just war theory, uh, the two different aspects about is this a just war, war or are we executing it justly? And if you take people out of this that don't have a sense of morality and a sense of values, mm-hmm. uh, it, you, you're potentially in a very dangerous situation. I don't, I don't know if you, did you ever see the movie uh, Dr. Strangelove? Oh, Okay. Great, great, oh my great, uh, film, uh, great in my great talk film about all the time. Right, great film about the the Cold War, but you know the way the movie ends, the Soviets in this case uh, had developed this doomsday device, which was going to automatically uh, be triggered if there was a nuclear explosion and launch everything, um, and and of course there's a lot of lessons here about. Uh, uh, about not having the effect they wanted because they didn't tell their adversaries about it, and so it can't be a can't serve as a deterrent if we don't know about it or anything. Uh, but that particular case, they took the man out of it. There was no ability to stop. It was just an automatic response, and of course, the ending of the movie was the ending of the world uh, because we took the person out of the loop. Well, there's a, there's actually a story of that of a, I'm trying to remember his name now, um, a Soviet uh, who was in uh, gentleman who was in charge of launching the nuclear weapons, and there was a false alarm during the Cold War, um, but it looked real at every possible level, and he made the decision, and he delayed for I think it was like two full minutes, which you know you know, two minutes whatever, right? Two minutes when you've got the, you know, the weight of the world quite literally on your back. Must I can't even imagine the level of that pressure. And he chose not to do it, and it didn't show up until a false alarm, like till like almost two minutes in. But he was supposed to push the button, which would have launched the world into a nuclear action. I mean, without that humanity, without that morality, without that sense of potential devastation on other human beings like wow so i think it's a very important point and that really brings us to something that you know you and i definitely want to talk about which is how do you define the problem because i think that if we're defining the problem as these are the enemy and we've got to take them out that is a very limited definition Right. It, it, how do we define the problem in order to make the solution? Because I think we're we're often looking from a very limited mindset. Yeah. I thanks, Doug. You know, Einstein was once asked, "If you had an hour to save the world, what would you do?" And he said, "Well, I'd I'd spend the first fifty five minutes studying the problem, mm. and the last five actually solving." Mm. Now, we, we have a system, uh, and there's a lot of planning systems in business and different countries. I'll just briefly describe the U.S. military system. It's, it's called the military decision-making process. And without going into all the details, basically you get a set of orders or direction, and then you try to figure out what's really important, what are all the specified and applied tasks, what's most important from that. You figure out what your mission is. And then you develop some different options. Uh, we call them courses of action, but you can go, you know, course action A, B, or C. Right. You compare those, you know, and you look at, try to get into the details. If you don't have a lot of time, this is a very quick process. But if you have time, you can actually do war games through each of these. Mm-hmm. 
and you select the best one and and then you fine tune it and move out. So everybody knows that. And, you know, by the time I reached the level of, of being a three-star general, a theater army commander, all of my captains and majors understood that and they were ready to move out. But here's the issue. That military decision-making process in its simplest form is just a problem-solving technique. Right. But if you're not solving the right problems, you're going to be at least wasting a lot of effort and potentially causing many, many worse problems. Now, my experience is that in a crisis, you rarely get orders, or if you get them, they're going to come way too late. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important things that the leader can do is figure out the problem you're actually trying to solve. So here, here's the here's the scenario. It's uh, summer of 2017. I've just come off of leading the military forces in support of FEMA for Hurricane Harvey, which you may remember was Texas and Louisiana. I mean, a wicked storm raved more than five feet on the east side of Houston. Uh, and then Hurricane Irma, about five days later, which was wow. which was in Florida, ripping up the west coast of Florida. And initially, we had another one of our elements. This was a maritime element that was already down in the Caribbean. So my boss, when when Hurricane Maria was coming, she decided, and I think it was absolutely the right decision, at least initially, was, hey, we're going to put this maritime element in charge down there. They're already there, and they can deal with it. Well... What we, we didn't know early on was how bad it was in Puerto Rico. And uh, and this maritime element, great guys, wonderful leader. Um, but, but it was going to be much, much bigger than what they could handle. Anyway, I was on a uh, I was on an earthquake exercise. This is five days after landfall. I was in California, and she calls me seven words. Go to Puerto Rico and fix it. Okay, so there's your entire set of operations orders with all your specified and applied tests and everything. Now, I got I to gotta say, well, hold on a sec. Let me just take a minute to read through the pages. That's right. So, so I got I to gotta tell you, so I really appreciated her confidence, which was great. Yeah. But I spent for the entire time, first fly back to Texas, picking up a bag and seven guys, which is all I could take initially. And then onward to Puerto Rico, and, and all the airports were shut to civilian traffic, you know, so I had to work in, get a military flight down. Um, I spent that whole time trying to sort through what was what was it I was actually trying to fix? What yes. was our core problem? And, you know, without without going into tremendous detail, here, here's what, what we, this group of seven folks, came to. First of all, you know, I just left both Texas and Florida, two of our richest states. Puerto Rico was $74 billion in debt before the storm hit. Right. Secondly, the Texas and Florida both had great emergency management agencies, a lot of reps, a lot of capability. And there, the system worked the way it was supposed to. The federal government so supposed to support the state. Well, Day three after landfall in Puerto Rico, the director of the emergency management agency for Puerto Rico went on vacation and never came back. They when just all the whoa, 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 pause, pause, pause. They the hurricane has come and he's got oh, well, my vacation's due, so I'm off now. No, yeah, he just left. They quit. And what they yes, and so that was going to be a problem. FEMA, I think you know, FEMA had. Of course, they had the A-plus team in Texas. And while Texas is going on, we have Hurricane Irma hit U.S. Virgin Islands in Florida. And so then they send the A-team or the A-minus team. But there's, they only have so many resources. And then 10 days later, uh, Puerto Rico was hit. So they were struggling a little bit with respect to resources. And all of that is why we need to pay, that's why they needed pay Patels. But we won't go there. No, we won't. I was there in that room, but... Thankfully, not on camera. Um, so, so they, uh, you know, all the emergency supplies that FEMA had in the Caribbean had been on Puerto Rico. But when Hurricane Irma hit U.S. Virgin Islands, they shipped everything oh, rightfully yeah. to the Virgin Islands. Yeah. 
So, you know, the store was empty. And, you know, when the governor of Texas needed help from fellow governors, fellow states, all he had to do was pick up the phone and they could drive down I-10, I-20, I-30, I-35. Same thing with Florida, right? I-10, I-95, I-75. Hey, Puerto Rico, the nearest U.S. piece of land, was a thousand miles away. And all of the seaports are shut and all the airports are shut. So they're very, very isolated. All of this stuff combined led me to believe we're we're just gonna have to we're gonna have to act very differently. Instead of us supporting FEMA, supporting the state in some of this, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to lead with a pretty heavy hand. Even though that's not the way the system is designed. I'll give you a quick example. You know, air, uh, the way requests for, or the way aircraft are supposed to be committed, I had 72 helicopters at my disposal down there. And the way that I'm supposed to commit those is when people ask for help, we're supposed to give them these assets. Yeah. The problem is all the cell phone towers are down. All the microwave antennas are down. There's no way for people to ask for help. And so I just had all our pilots load up with all the food and water and just go fly people, fly to people and find where they need help and just start giving stuff. We're going to push it instead of have it be pulled. Right. And, uh, and you know, that system worked pretty well. Uh, but it was, it was all started with understanding what the problem was. The problem was that the system had broken down. So we're going to have to act on naturally. And of course, that changes over time. And every time you work on the problem, you change the nature of the problem. And and so this is not a one-time thing, understanding what that problem is. You have to but come You just said something there that you and I had talked about previously in our previous conversation, which I thought was a really important point, is that most leaders have never considered that their presence has changed the situation. And that's not always for the better. That their very presence, even though their intention might be incredibly good, their presence has now added another dynamic. Talk to us a little bit about that, Jeff, because I know that's just that's a deep area for you. And I know that you understand that probably better than anybody I've ever spoken to uh, from that military position of like, you're here. Did it get better or worse? Yeah, so... Again, the nature of the problem changes over time, and your actions cha help change the nature of the problem. Right. So what we're doing early in a hurricane response is all about saving lives. You know, we're gonna we're gonna uh, do what we can to provide emergency medical treatment or fly somebody out if they need help, or in the case I just exa example I just gave, pass out bottles of water. You know, we passed out more than one are 46 million liters of water, okay, over this period of several weeks. I mean, and it was, I mean, we were putting pallets of these things on helicopters and flying them into the jungle, and, and we were pushing all this. And it was great. And it was really important during that life-saving phase. But over time, uh, as we started getting water systems back and everything, people really loved these free bottles of water. Right. And it was it was really good stuff. And we had a lot we could keep giving them. But at the same time, we're trying to help the economy get back under its feet and help work, help transition from this emergency response into a recovery. So free bottled water sounds really good unless you own a grocery store in my was Puerto Rico. And part of how you make your money is to sell water because you can't compete with free. So now we, the government, are actually getting our actions, although meant for the right thing and for the right reason, over time, they're actually hindering recovery. We're getting in the way of helping a return to normalcy. So, but if, but if, you, if you focus on that, you understand it, you relook at this, what's this core problem? What are we facing right now? We, we had the same thing, you know, with our hospital ship in the Port of San Juan. They passed out more than 5,000 pairs made 5,000 pairs of eyeglasses. It was great training for our optometrists. People were happy. They got free eyeglasses, you know, and again, it sounds wonderful unless you're an optometrist, <laughs> you know, you can't compete with free. And so we've got to be really careful with how we do this. Sometimes 
our good intentions can can actually get in the way of helping things get better. So I want you to understand that I'm going to ask you a question here. There's nothing gotcha about it. So to, to be clear, that's not my intention. But it is an important question um, because there are all kinds of invasions and coups and some come with bullets and bombs and some come with foreign policy or economic issues or strangulation in some cases. The U.S. has military, ba- eight, I think it's more than 800 military bases across the planet. And rightly or wrongly, the U.S. had become the police force for the, for the world. It became what Rome was, an international police force. And I believe, and it's my, maybe it's my illusion, I believe that most of the people involved in that are trying to do something better trying to make the situation better. But in many cases, it is exactly what you just said. The, you know, and of course, we can take a look at Iraq or, uh, or Afghanistan or wherever it is, particularly leaving Afghanistan after going in, and go, did we make it better? Did we actually make it better? You know, you look at uh, 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 Libya. There's a lot of countries like that, you know. The, uh, which is not talked about much anymore, but Libya went at a, a very good economy. It was doing very well. Was there a dictator? Yes. Do we need to remove the dictator? Is that our job? I don't know. Um, and then you've got, you know, we've got to remove Saddam Hussein for his weapons of mass destruction that we can't find. And did we make it better? And then we're going to go into Afghanistan. Okay. But how is that impacting the real people of Afghanistan? Because we were there with when the Soviets were there, and we got out fight the Soviets off when we backed the Mujahideen, who were undefeated for four hundred freaking years. Um, but we're going to go in and be the police force there, and now we're going back and we're going to try and kill the Mujahideen because they've changed names. So it like I'm sorry, Jeff. I, it just it's like because I'm geopolitical, you know that we had a combo. Like for me, I was like, oh. I feel like so often the intention is good, but the application is horrendous and damaging. And I see it in leadership. I see it in consulting. So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm way to pick one. I, I don't want to, I won't go into the specifics on any of those. because No, of course. Obviously, I have a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in a lot of those things. Uh, personal experience, and I've lost a lot of friends. And Not I, that. So for me, it's very personal. Yeah. But I I think that two comments I'll make. One, the military is only one instrument of national power. We have generally what we call four. Yeah. And the acronym, easy to remember, is DIME. Diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. Well, if 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 the military is the first and only tool we employ... Um, we're going to become pretty short-sighted, you know, and we're we're a bunch of hammers looking for nails. Yeah. And that may not be the appropriate, it may not be the appropriate blend. That's why, you know, the military doesn't do foreign policy. I mean, we're one of the tools that help enact foreign policy, but diplomacy is very, very important. And it's all guided. What you hope is that our national security apparatus comes together and has elements of each of those four different national or four different uh, elements of power to apply to a situation and to get the right balance. And frequently, we don't get it right. Frequently, mm-hmm. we don't get the balance right. Um, sometimes it's because of resources. You know, we want the State Department to do something, but we haven't resourced them properly, so now the military ends up doing it. Well, you know, uh, we in the military tend to be tend to see ourselves as action figures. We want to make stuff happen, and we want to make it happen now. And sometimes, if it's a diplomatic solution, you know, there's a reason that the the culture of the foreign service of the United States is very different than the culture of the military. And it's you know they're looking at what's gonna what's it gonna be like in 30 years. Right. What's it gonna be like next week? Yeah. And so they have a different perspective. So you have to have those four elements of power 
in balance. The second thing is, and we should, we will always, and we should always act in whatever is in our national interest. But, but if we try to act alone instead of in concert with allies and partners, uh, it rarely goes real well. Because mm-hmm. if we work hard, again, based on shared values, to bring a lot of the rest of the world with us, then. Uh, then it tends to go up better. You know, I I know that was a broad answer. If you want to get, if you want me to jump into specifics on Iraq or Afghanistan, I can. Um, but but hopefully that well, you just to, hopefully that paints a picture. Take we have to be part of a team here. Yeah, Not, I, I, that's what I want to take it into this piece because, you know, you quite literally have the boots on the ground experience, and so. I don't know too many, as I told you, I have many military friends. I don't know too many people who think, you know, uh, that raiding, uh, that what happened after 9-11 was a good choice. Like, I I don't think even my military friends are like, yeah, that could have been done better. And there was all kinds of mess. But there's still this human piece, which is, I mean, aside from being an invading force, you would, I imagine, like I'm making shit up here because I'm not in the military, right? I was never in the military. But I can't imagine what it was like to go in, do these things, to lose men who you build a bond and care about with, and then realize that those upon high gave you orders that got your people killed in a situation they shouldn't have been in, and, and I'm not asking you to to uh, to justify those people, but I just want to understand what it was like for you because you're a, you're a leader of men, right? Yeah. This is not a leader in war; it's a leader in of men who are given a set of orders to be in a place that literally cost them their life, and that righteousness has done it as opposed to that humility and that compassion and that emotional intelligence, which you speak so much about. Yeah, I think, um, so let me, let me try to answer it this way. Uh, I don't think there was necessarily a, a driving force or somebody with evil intent trying to do something, but you know, I, I, I think I can make a pretty good argument that going to Afghanistan to prevent um, terrorists em- that were emanating from Afghanistan from affecting the United States or Europe or the rest or, rest or Western world because of what just happened was a was a sound decision and a good thing. The real problem is when we tried to turn Afghanistan into Iowa, Afghanistan was never going to be I didn't have or wouldn't have democratic values it didn't you know it just it w- so it was the initial focus and in fact if you look at what we did over a 20 year deployment we were pretty good at keeping terrorism from impacting the United States that was coming out of Afghanistan we actually solved that but the real issue was we we tried to help create and for all the right reasons it was not because we were trying to get rich off of their oil they don't have any oil or whatever it was it was for the right reasons that we were trying to help create a system of government that was for the people and serve the people and would not be violent to its neighbors and all these kinds of things but but you know i think the issue is changing mission and and not focused on, not just staying limited, limited focus on that initial task. And that's especially when I got into that, those four different elements of national power. Well, the military can do pretty good at that first one. We're not very good at creating democracy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is, it requires everything. And, and so, you know, I won't, how do you, how do I won't you, belabor it. I know we're here to talk about, I, I want to know how, because this is personal. So, how does that? Because I'm actually interested in 
in the impact on you as a human? Because you've talked a lot about this. Because, you know, one of the things that you and I both know is that to be a great leader, you got to know yourself, know thyself, right? Yeah. And so I'm interested in the impact on you at a personal level of the, the, the grief, the PTSD, whatever term one wants to use, at, at losing people, losing, you know, the, these lives. Um, yeah, so I'm wearing a... Uh... I'm wearing a bracelet here um, that uh, was given to me by the wife of one of my soldiers who was killed in Afghanistan. And um, the the two of us were together through three different tours in Iraq, and he was killed on his second tour in Afghanistan. And uh, I think of him every day. And that's part of why I wear this bracelet. You know, like I said, his his wife gave me this. I'm actually, that's technically not correct because she gave me one that was two times ago. The bracelet is worn worn down and it turns just silver. You can't read it anymore. And I order a new one. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to me, it you know the cost of going to war and losing our our young men and women is uh, it, it's a it's a very very steep price to pay, um, and I'm not the kind of person who will say that I'm not a pacifist, you know, but but I'm certainly not a war monger, no, if you know what I mean, because I've I've seen it, I've lived it, I've I've had that kind of loss. I do. There is something that that I think is applicable to business leader. And this isn't about, this isn't about combat, but you're going to have, your employees are going to experience loss. And sometimes you may not. And I think, you know, one thing that I learned, especially I might have three guys killed in a platoon in an ambush, uh, and I didn't know them personally was the most important thing I could do is go there to that platoon because they're suffering at this point in time. And I learned, you know, that I needed to be there for them. Now, they, it's uncomfortable to do that and because you don't know what to say. And frankly, there is nothing you can say. But you can, other than, I don't know what to say, but, I, but I'm here for you. I want to be here for you. That communicates leadership, and you will have a deeper sense of the cost of some of these decisions. Well, the, the reason I said business leaders doesn't have to be guys getting killed in an ambush. It could be, you know, one of your employees, you know, just lost her mother to cancer or just got divorced or whatever. Yeah. You know, I, I, I had a... Uh, I had a good friend, and she's still a good friend. She's what we call a gold star mom. Yep. Her, her son, she lost her son. Her son was in the Army, and she lost her son, and she was an avid runner. And her best friend was her running partner. But once she lost her friend, her best friend avoided her because she didn't. She was uncomfortable, didn't know what to say. And actually, avoiding somebody when they're going through these kinds of things is the worst thing you could do. You, you, you know, you got to get over yourself, get over your lack of comfort, and go there and be there for them. And you know, just just be there for them and help them. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I I am certainly not a perfect person. Um, I uh, I miss the uh, the troops I've lost. I think about them. Um, I, uh, you know, but it's, I also have a responsibility that um, when I get ordered to do something that is not in, built on the right foundation of values, it's my order to, it's, uh, you know, I'm not, we are not supposed to blindly follow orders. You know, this was the defense in the Nuremberg trials. The guys are saying, well, I was following orders. Well, you're responsible to do the right thing as an individual. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, 
I had this, I was leading all the troops. You may, you may remember in 2018, we had, uh, we deployed, it's about 6,000 soldiers and Marines to the southwest border. We had this situation where, at least through the media, we're going to have these massive, what they call caravans, or people mm -hmm. coming up through Mexico, not really originating there, originating mostly in Guatemala or some places like that. Right. And, and you know, the narrative coming out of Washington, D.C. was we're going to have soldiers on the border with machine guns. But that's not, I mean, you know, the implication is we're going to shoot people if they're trying to come across the border. That's not what we were there to do. We were there on a legitimate mission to support the Border Patrol and the Customs Service because they needed help. They needed help with obstacles. They needed help with uh, medevac, you know, moving their troops around with helicopters, with some communication, all kinds of things. And so we were there, and we were even helping observe things. But we weren't there to do law enforcement tests, no. you know, very specifically. So, um, you know, I countered that. Uh, I countered that narrative in a very public way. Good. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I had some painful moments because of that, but that was I'm okay. sure. the right thing to do. But again, the, that brings me back to that piece we've talked about twice now already, which is know thyself. Yeah, so let me, I don't know if you've ever read um, The Ark of War. Of course. Uh, and of course, I'm looking at the name and the English version looks like Sun Tzu. I asked somebody who spoke Mandarin once and, and they told me, no, it's Shin Tzu. Anyway, Shin Tzu was this ancient Chinese commander, philosopher, and he wrote a series of maxims, yeah. all kinds of different things about warfare. And of course, this book is not just about warfare. It's about business. It's about leadership. And about a hundred years ago or so, somebody collected all this stuff and put it together in a book called The Art of War. Anyway, it's a great book. Mm -hmm. But one of my favorite maxim is the commander who knows himself and knows his enemy will be victorious in a hundred battles. Now, I'm sure that when Shinza wrote this, he was thinking about when he said knowing himself, he's thinking about the strengths and weaknesses of his own forces compared with the enemy. But I'll take it a step further. I'll say the leader who knows himself or herself will be victorious. You, ha you have to know yourself. You have to know what your own strengths are. You have to know what your preferred decision-making and leadership styles are. And knowing yourself is good, but here's the key insight. It's not good enough. Mm. You actually have to open that up and share with others so that they can help mitigate the weaknesses of your preferred style. So here's... Here's the story. I was, um, 2008, I was the deputy commander of our 10th Mountain Division. Again, I was the operations guy. So I was away from the headquarters six days a week or whatever. I came back in one night after being out on a mission all day, all hot and sweaty, carrying my rifle. And my boss, the division commander, is really, um, is really agitated. Now, my boss was a wonderful guy. And he worked for a wonderful guy. But the two of them uh, did not get along. In fact, I'd say it was uh, vinegar and oil, but it was more like vinegar and baking soda, right? And so, so I asked my boss, I said, well, what's wrong? He said, well, we've got a conflict in decision-making styles. And, I, and I'm and i sure I gave him, you know, the RCA dog look. And I said, well, look, let me give you, let me give you a medical analogy, which I've always found really helpful. He said, he said, some guys we call emergency room doctors. You know, they are happy to make decisions with only about 60% of the information. They want to get things moving, start triage, figuring out how to start, you know, get their folks out, start stabilizing patients. Yeah. They make decisions really quickly with only a little bit of the information. Mm -hmm. The problem is they don't always make the best decision because they're deciding in a hurry. Yeah. So now the next group of guys, let's call them surgeons. Surgeons need 90% of the information, and they almost always make the right decision, and the patient almost always gets better. But the patient has to get really sick before he sees a surgeon. He said, now, the last group of guys always operate with 100% of the information, and they always make the right decision. The problem is we call them pathologists. And, and so I laughed, you know, and I said, well, it's obviously 
better to be an emergency room doc. I, I was an emergency room doc, if you will. And yeah. so was my boss. Yeah. And his boss was not. I said, well, it's obviously better to be an emergency room doc. He said, no, no, you're missing the point. It's not. That's your bias. That's just the way it is. He said, but if you're going to be an emergency room doc, you better understand. You better help other people understand this is how you make decisions. So you got to mitigate the weaknesses. And if they're going to be a surgeon, you need to figure out how do I empower my team so that they keep this patient healthy while I'm waiting for more information to make a decision. So I'm mindful of that. Flash forward again, August of 2017. I'm the new commander of this task force that's coming together to help Texas with Hurricane Harvey. And, you know, my troops, Army, in this Army headquarters, they knew me and they knew what I was like. But I've got soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines from all over the United States. These people don't know me at all and, and don't have a clue. So I got them all together and I told them that story. And I said, I'm an emergency room guy. If you bring something to me that even hints like you want a decision, I'm going to make a decision. Right. So if you don't want me to make a decision, you need to start out with, sir, please don't make a decision on this. This is just for information. And likewise, sometimes I'm going to decide to go left. And three days later, we're going to figure out, man, we really should have got right. Mm -hmm. and, and when that happens, you have a responsibility, not just a right but a responsibility to come back and tell me to turn right now. Because I don't always, because I decide things in such a hurry, I don't always make the best decision. And I don't want us to walk off a cliff holding hands. I want to do the right thing for the organization. So what I was trying to do was empower them to mitigate the weaknesses of my preferred style. And so it's really critical to know yourself. And you can know yourself. I mean, that's an example. There's also, you know, Wires Briggs, the Enneagram is a great tool. There's all different kinds of tools you can use, man. Better understand yourself. But especially if you're building a team in a crisis, you got to open up to other people and say, look, here's how I am. Here's how I'm wired. And, and part of that is so that they better understand you and they know that, hey, if, if you give this guy a matrix on a PowerPoint chart, he's going to flip out or whatever. Part of it is that, but part of it is also to enable them to mitigate the weaknesses of your style. What a, really important in a crisis. What a brilliant place for us to finish. Super. I love that analogy. It's very powerful. And I think it's something we can all take pause and go, okay, where do I fit in that? Uh, uh, and am I allowing myself to actually be any of the three? Because if you're afraid of decisions, you're not going to make any of them. And that's... And, if you're going to lead, you have to make decisions. Jeff, this has been a absolute pleasure and an honor, sir. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us. I hope you'll stay with us to the end. Um, for you to listen, remember that you can reach out to Jeff. And so, Jeff, please tell people where they can find out more about you and about all of your wonderful resources. Yeah, so the best is my website, jeffreysbuchanan.com. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. And, of course, we'll make sure that uh, the links are posted in the show notes and uh, so you'll be able to reach Jeff in any way, shape, or form. Remember that those who control the meaning for the tribe also control the movement of that tribe, whether that's a military tribe or whether that's your business. When business and political leaders are committed, who are committed to positively shaping the landscape know that they must tap into what drives human behavior. And you can do that through tapping into and understanding how to apply the anatomy of meaning extracted from the emotional source code of your people and your organization. I'm Dov Barron. I show businesses, teams, and leaders how to harness their emotional source code to move their tribe because actualized unified meaning is the single monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness for all individuals and companies. I want to thank you for sharing this show with everyone you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you're making decisions. Are you making decisions in chaos that don't belong in a chaotic situation? Or are you making situations in chaos that are befitting of the chaos? And are you ready to pivot and change? There's a lot to learn in this podcast. If you didn't catch the whole thing, go back. I promise you there are some very key 
strategic insights for you around decision making in any chaotic situation in any chaos. I'm Dov Barron and I'm here to assist you tapping into your deepest meaning to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose and profit in your business, in your life and in your leadership impact. And I am out.